Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. We're going to give everyone just a couple minutes to uh, to trickle in, so we'll get started at about uh, about two three minutes from now. So, good morning and welcome. All right, well, let's get started, everyone. Um, once again, welcome to our uh, STI's educational webinar series. Um, we're really excited to have you join us for this webinar. We have a ton of great information to share with you this morning, and uh, this is our probably our most requested uh, webinar topic, so we're really excited to be able to bring this to you along with, uh, along with our partners at Mercury, CSC, and uh, and Donnie Clapp is going to be presenting today. My name is Jeremy Sampson, and I am STI's Director of Marketing. Um, again, this is uh, Finding Your Voice, Building an Audience with Social Media. This is the first of uh, two webinars that we'll be hosting on social media. The next one uh, will be next week, and we'll talk about that for a, a minute at the end. Uh, before we get started, I just want to share a couple of uh, ground rules for our webinars. Um, the audience is muted. Um, but that doesn't mean that we uh, don't encourage participation. In fact, we love to hear from you. So um, please submit questions at any time uh, via the question, uh, the chat tool that is on your uh, GoToWebinar application, um, or just drop a note to say hello um, throughout the webinar, or give us any feedback. Um, we will leave uh, about 20 minutes for Q&A, 20 minutes or so at the end. Um, so please uh, do send questions throughout. You can send them as, as they come. And, I'll be, uh, I'll be back on after the presentation to help moderate that, that Q&A. Uh, even if we don't get to your question today, um, we will follow up with you directly um, afterwards to make sure that we uh, get your question answered. Um, in terms of our agenda, I'm going to start with a quick overview of STI, then I will turn it over to Donnie. Um, and again, I'll be back at the end for the Q&A and a couple of closing, closing thoughts. Um, we will be sending out this presentation as well as the full audio recording a few hours after the webinar is complete. Uh, usually people ask for that and uh, we will be sending that out. So just uh, hold tight for a couple hours afterwards and, and we'll be getting out to, uh, that out to you via email. Um, Donnie, if we could go to the next slide, please. So just want to do a quick introduction to STI. Sustainable Travel International is a is a global organization focused on providing sustainability solutions. Uh, we work with tourism businesses, destinations, and other organizations uh, with a goal of having a positive impact on the triple bottom line, which means protecting the environment, preserving cultural heritage, and contributing to economic development. SCI is dedicated to taking a holistic approach to addressing sustainable development within the travel and tourism industries. Uh, we provide solution-oriented programs that generate tangible results and ultimately affect lasting change. That's what we're here for. Next slide, please. SCI has been working with destinations and travel and tourism industry leaders worldwide since 2002. We work with some key players in the, in the industry and as you can see, a variety of destinations worldwide. 
And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Donnie Clapp of Mercury CSC, and he'll take us through the social media presentation. Hello, everybody. My name is Donnie Clapp. Thanks for coming today. Um, would like to officially welcome you on behalf of myself and Mercury CSC. This presentation is called Finding Your Voice creating strong bonds with your customers via social media. I am going to pull up a little video of me so you can see my smiling face as I talk to you. It's a little delayed, so um, I'm not going to be demonstrating anything here, but just so you can connect my eyes with my voice, hopefully that will be helpful for you. And uh, again, welcome to the scene. Okay, here we go. Again, I'm Donnie Clapp. You see there a picture of me vigorously doing the uh, bull ride on the back of a truck. This is at a company retreat for us. And I work for Mercury CSC. Now, who is Mercury CSC? Mercury CSC connects brands to consumers who value all and outdoor sectors. We're a full service firm. We do everything from PR to um, brand strategy. I am the community manager at Mercury CSC, which means that I am the main social media dude. Um, my main client is the Montana Office of Tourism. So I do execution for them, but I also do consulting and strategy for some other clients as well as internally. I'm going to pull up our website real quick and show you who we are. And I want to talk about, um, in just a minute, our approach and how it relates to what I'm going to be talking today, talking about today. Um, I wanted to start with this quote from Twitter user Mohammed A. Algari. And he says, I can see the pyramids through Google, but I cannot understand the Egyptian culture and mentality except by visiting tourism-linked cultures. And I think this is really important because Social media obviously is important to business now and do while maintaining that they're both independently important. We actual travel and that's good because actual travel is how we make our money. So surprise, if your eyes are as big as this fish, then I would be rather surprised. Um, this slide is a little bit of tongue in cheek because what I'm going to tell you now is that social media is important to what you do, but you already know that. I'm going to go through a few things that are probably old news to you, although this is a new study. These kinds of numbers that have been coming out for years, and you know already that you really need to be using social media in your tourism-based business. Um, but let me just go through a few of these. This is from a really recent study from Nielsen, who the same Nielsen who um, has always done TV ratings is now getting into Internet stuff. They said in this 2011 report, and um, this link to this actual report will be in the slides that Jeremy sends out at the end of this. So don't worry about going to trying to find it now. Um, we'll send you the direct link later. So they said that social media is 23% of time spent online throughout all of Americans and all of the Internet, which is pretty significant. 55 plus, those people 55 and over have increased their use of social media uh, in terms of hours spent double in one year since last year. It's a huge gain. Women are heavier social media users, and we also know from other research in the travel industry that women tend to plan travel. Some studies would say that up to 85% of vacations are planned by the women in households. 53% of people on social media follow at least one brand, and again, that's something that you know sort of intuitively, but just wanted to reiterate. I do have, this is the demographic breakdown of the Montana Facebook page. The Montana Facebook page has about 120,000 fans. If you're not a fan, um, but you are into the Montana mystique, I would encourage you to go become a fan now. Our, that page has grown completely organically. We've never run any sort of promotion to try to get people to become fans. So the only way people find it is by searching for it or by clicking through a regular old Facebook link on the visitmt.com page. So I point that out because I think that that makes this demographic breakdown really representative of our true fan base. Um, at least our true and I think people with rewards. So for Montana, 61% female, 37% about 60,000 fans, and those ratios have remained a, a, a much smaller split over all of online, over all of social media. Females represented maybe 55%, and males represented 45 So take this travel industry, females are even more overrepresented on social media channels, and I think that's really interesting. Um, this is another graph, uh, and this will be the last one, but this is a graph that just came out the other day, US and all the different lines represent five different entities. One is Facebook, just Facebook. The second is all Google sites 
The third is all Yahoo sites. The fourth is all Microsoft sites. And the fifth is AOL and its sites. And you see everybody's flat or declining. Google's got a little bit of an upward trend, but Facebook is like breaking the mold. And if that trend line co continues, pretty soon that's all we're going to be doing online. So um, only becoming more important. And I, I, I also want to say that for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to be mostly talking about Facebook because I think it provides good examples and also because I think that if you're just getting started with social media for your brand, Facebook is probably the best choice. Um, it's the best place to start, the best thing to concentrate on to begin with. Um, on our, in, in our October 6th webinar that we're going to be doing, I will be talking a lot more about all the different platforms, integrated campaigns, how to sort of leverage these different platforms and channels against each other to improve results and really make a mark. Um, but for right now, most of my examples are going to be Facebook-based, and, and I think that that simplifies the presentation a little bit. So to the meat of my story here, you see here in front of you the Rat Pack playing pool around a pool table. They are having a really easy time talking to each other. And you notice that the title of this presentation is Finding Your Voice. And what I want to talk to you guys about today is individual talking, having come as a representative of your brand, talking, having conversations online translates to fans and followers. So the question I want to ask to start out with is why is this easy? We all know that it's easy to sit around talking to our friends, especially our best friends, but anybody that we've known for a while and that only expects us to be ourselves. Why is that easy? Well, I propose that it's for a few reasons. One, you know who you are. You know who your friends are, you know what they like, you know what they expect, and you've practiced. I think that those five things are the important reasons that talking, having conversations with your friends and relatives is easy and comfortable and not stressful for most people. And I think that by far the most important two of these five things are the first two. You know who you are and you know who your friends are. Let's talk a little bit about your best, most loyal friends. Your best, most loyal friends, as these cute little lambs here demonstrate, they're stand-ins for your best, most loyal friends. All have a few things in common. And You'll see the parallels I'm going to start to draw between you as an individual and you as a representative of your brand and your brand as a personality here in a second. Your best, most loyal friends have these things in common. You do not put on a show for them. You do not change your likes or dislikes or interests or sense of humor or pretend to be somebody you're not when you interact with them. If you meet them, if you meet your buddies for a beer after work, you don't, they're not wondering which Donnie Clapp is going to show up. They're expecting their buddy Donnie to show up. And to take that a step further, second bullet point, they can sense if something you say or do is you or not. And I'm going to propose that your best, most loyal customers and fans, especially online, have this same sense about your brand and that that's really important in how you decide to interact with your consumers, with your fans, as your brand. Um, your best, most loyal friends, and you have been through something together. They appreciate how you look when you dress up, and they prefer you didn't always dress up. Now, that's a little cryptic, so, so let me explain. Your best, most loyal friends, if, let's say, and you um, are in the dressing room or in your house, and you put on your tuxedo or your evening gown or whatever it may be, something you don't wear often, clean up nice, or you really look great, and whatever's are, maybe you're going to go host the, the Oscars or something. So, slightly, uh, I don't want to say fake, but slightly um, less authentic or more salesy for drinks or at their house or had dinner with them. If every time you did that, got up in the cologne and the perfume, your friends would get annoyed with you. They'd start to wonder you know, who you really are. And my, my supposition to you is that your brand is the same. Your relationship with your best, most loyal fans, your best, most loyal customers is the same way. They appreciate when you get into sales mode, when you need to prove that you're awesome, that your brand is awesome. They're going to act successful and get out there and sell yourself. But they prefer if that weren't your only mode, okay? If you're always being salesy, they're going to start to wonder who the real you is, and it's not going to be good. Okay, so step one to a successful strategy. Step one to finding your voice. Oh, my gosh. Okay, let me pause here and just say, you guys see on the bottom left-hand corner of my screen, I have a Twitter window open, and it's scrolling the 
finding your voice hashtag. If you are on Twitter, go ahead and check in there. It'll be on the bottom left of every slide. And uh, go ahead and check in. You can also ask questions. Jeremy's on there. He's going to be monitoring um, what you guys are saying. And uh, if you want to ask questions there, he'll keep track of those, just like he will of the questions asked through the GoToWebinar interface. So yeah, get on Twitter, hit finding your voice hashtag, and uh, you can watch your stuff scroll right there. <laughs> okay, so step one to a successful business brand strategy online is knowing yourself. And you see this cute dog looking at himself in the reflection in the stand there. <coughs> Just like you, your brand is more than the sum of its parts. I'm going to submit to you that this step, this sort of nebulous know yourself step, although it sounds sort of cliche, is the, by far, the most important thing that you can do in order to have a successful social media strategy. And it's a hard step. It's difficult to do well and to really understand your brand as a personality, as a entity that's going to interact with the public. But it's really important because that's how the public sees your brand, especially online on these social media channels like Facebook. They interact with your brand and they want it to interact with them back with personality, with a point of view. And not only that, but they want it to be the same personality and point of view that they have already projected onto your brand after having discovered it or experienced it um, once or, or many times. So a little primer here, these four bullet points are going to get you on the right track, but I would highly encourage you if you haven't gone through a structured brand discovery process to do that for yourself, whether it's self-directed or with the help of a third party, it's really important from your competitors and from those similar in your space. What does your brand love? Okay, start to ask yourself these questions that are more personal. They imply um, that your brand is a person. If you start thinking of your brand as a person, if your brand were to show up to a dinner party, what would he be wearing or she? What would he or she want to talk about? What would he love? What would she be annoyed by? These things, these sorts of perspectives are going to help you speak with your brand's true voice and be effective. And, you're, and that's going to create good connections with your customers. What does your brand, brand truly know a lot about? In what area are you an expert? Because experts are respected. And you can't pretend to be an expert. You can only convey actual expertise. Pretending to be an expert is a quick road to ruin online. Finally, how would, you, how would your best customers describe your brand? I just want to submit this thought exercise to you real quick. If you imagine your best, most loyal customer, maybe, maybe that couple that's been back to your hotel or destination every year for 20 years, if somebody were to ask them, describe X, describe brand X, this place, this business, this um, brand, how would you describe it? And if the way that they, if the things that they would point out that they think make you who you are are not the same things that you on a day-to-day -day basis project as what makes you who you are, if that's not the, if the five things they would say are not the main five things on your website about who your brand is, then that, that mismatch is important and it's telling and it's something that you should look at. Okay, so real world examples. Um, this is an example from Iceland and you may have seen this before, it's a pretty famous example of a successful integrated social media campaign. Iceland <coughs> has taken this to extreme and I'm going I'm to show you two examples that come from this extreme of not just thinking of the brand as a person to, which enables you to speak with a voice that is authentic, but actually personifying the brand. These brands have been personified, have been anthropomorphized. And here's Iceland at IcelandWantsToBeYourFriend.com, which is a great URL, by the way, saying, hello, humans of the Internet. And he goes on, or she, to say, I really want to be your friend, and this is who I am. And this is carried through all of their social media channels, especially Facebook. And in the bottom right there, I have what I think is one of my favorite examples of them really following in, in every situation. Because if you think about you as an individual, you don't only, you're not only yourself when you react to positive situations, you're also yourself in the way that you react to negative situations or ho-hum situations or, you know, wrong dates where whatever you're reacting to authentically. And this authenticity is a really important word. So here we have somebody, Nancy Orgasma, who has um, posted a spam link 
or not the spam link, but a piece of spam, has deleted it, A, has not um, ignored it and tried to push it down the page, but instead has responded in an authentic voice that sort of carries through this idea that you start to get in your mind when you first read this ISIN wants to be your friend page, and they say, that's a nice beer. And this is an extremely your brand, into, but these extremely commit that far. Most of you are not going to want to act your brand, your hotel, as an idea in terms of how it would interact with the world if it were. This next example is from Montana, the page that I manage. <clears throat> not nearly as genius as the Iceland response, but um, still shows that we are using um, on Dan. And in fact, you know, we may not have even responded to this if we weren't committed to the Montana voice. And here, roll over again, and we say, sorry, footnote, not actually sorry. <laughs> and we put a link in there, which, you know, Montana's a big, it's a government entity, it's a big, serious brand in a lot of ways. Um, but here I am using an emoticon, and I think that it fits the Montana brand rather well. Um, and she responds to it well. So um, another good example. So step two, uh, out of those five things, I'm talking about the first two. Knowing yourself, knowing your audience, knowing who your friends are. Knowing who your audience, um, if you know who you are as your brand, can be just as easy as talking to your friends as yourself. And it's also important to remember that your best customers, like your best friends, know more about you than someone who hasn't put in the time and effort. Um, that as you start to develop a following online on Facebook and other social media platforms, you're going to have an integrated fan base. And that fan base is going to include both loyal, diehard, brand advocates, the people that love you the most and would do anything to help you succeed, and on the other hand, people who have never been to your destination or never bought your product before. And those two sets of people are both listening to everything you say. And so it, it makes it tougher to have, have good, consistent, authentic messaging that speaks to all those people at once, but you don't want to forget either one of those groups. Um, and, and I would argue that getting is probably more important than attracting new customers because they will keep attracting new customers for you. Um, okay, so this is the same slide from earlier. And we're going to look at it from the perspective of your customers instead of your friends. So we're going to talk about these same six or these same five things in terms of your best, most loyal customers, your brand advocates, rather than your best, most loyal friends personally. You don't put on a show for them. So your brand is what it is. Your destination is what it is. They know what it is. They've experienced it fully. They know all the ins and outs. They know the pretty parts and the ugly parts. And pretending that any of that doesn't exist, or pretending the ugly parts don't exist, or that the pretty parts are prettier than they really are, um, is not going to help anybody as far as these people are concerned. You can't pretend to be somebody you're not in front of people who already know you really well. Um, they can feel important. They, if you, um, let's say you are, are in a situation where somebody has posted something negative about your business online, there's a way that the people who know you best, who know your brand best, would hope and expect you to respond to something like that. And if you instead get flustered and sort of maybe default to like lawyer mode, not you. It's not actually your brand that's speaking. It's somebody else, and that makes them sad. Um, you've been through something together. This just speaks to the fact that they've experienced your destination or product fully. Like I said before, they appreciate how you look when you dress up. They prefer you didn't always dress up. I hit on this earlier, but I think it's really important. They approve, but they don't want you to only be selling yourself. They also want to have a casual, friendly, intimate, real, authentic conversation with you. Is that enough buzzwords in one sentence? Hopefully it is. So finally, what to actually talk about? So I'm going to show a few more real-world examples of things that I think are good examples of how to do this well. And I want to point out that um, we're going to go into much more detail on October 6th in the second part of this series, the idea of finding your voice and talking to your customers to a whole so that you can speak directly to them and sort of um, give them exactly the content that they're looking for um, directly without having to rely on anybody else to do that for you. So make sure you come back up October 6th. There's going to be a whole lot more tactical stuff and, and a whole lot more platforms than just Facebook, and you'll already know everything that I've told you today, so we'll have a good base to speak from. So what to talk about? What are these camels talking about with each other, I wonder? I don't know. Um, in general, here's some things 
that you can talk about as your brand. What are your competitors doing? Do you think that your customers don't know that your competitors exist? Because if you do, you're wrong. So is there a danger in talking about what your competitors are doing? Probably not. How does your brand feel about what your competitors are doing? How, what are its aspirations? Would it like to do the same? Would it not do quite the same thing? What are your partners doing? Um, your partners in, let's say, you're a hotel. What is your um, destination marketing organization doing, your DMO? What, is, what are the airlines doing that come to your area? What are your um, recreational outfitters doing, online and offline? What do you think about that as your brand? How are you feeling today? Again, this is me encouraging you to your brand and given everything that's happened recently to your brand. Business is up, business is down. Um, the world is, you know, the economy is up, the economy is down, travel is fun, travel is not fun. That last one's probably not true. What, how do you feel about that? How does it make you feel as your brand? What has you frustrated? What's made you laugh recently as your brand? What does your brand think is funny out there in the world of your business or the world at large? What's changed the way you think about your brand, your industry, your customers? Let's talk about that. And two specific things that you had are what existing assets do you have? And by assets, I mean photos, videos, um, website, other websites, um, news articles, travel journalism about your place or destination, et cetera. And what can you cross promote? So let's look at a few of these things. This first example is from Whitefish Mountain Resort. Uh, which is a ski resort. It's a medium size in terms of business, but huge in terms of um, acreage. It's not a huge business. They don't have a full-time video production department, but they are really interested in using video. They find it to be successful for them online. And I, I wanted to show you this as an example because a lot of you, I'm sure, hear and read all the time, video photos, video photos, questions. These are the things you should be doing on Facebook. And it's true. But you don't have to create these things yourself. It's awesome if you can. And Whitefish Mountain Resort, of course, does create some videos for themselves. But they don't let it that limit them. And this is an example of somebody who's created a video, which if I were to be able to show this video to you, you'd realize that it's not all that great of a video, although it is kind of fun. Um, this is jam on, went down their alpine slide, and when they got home, they put the video on YouTube. Whitefish Mountain Resort staff found that video by searching for themselves on the Facebook page. And they didn't have to do any legwork to create that content, that content Facebook. <coughs> this is an example of a particularly complicated example. This is something you can go out and do right now. But I wanted to point out questions. People want to answer questions, and I just want to point out that you don't have to put a question mark at the end of the sentence in order to make it a question. You'll see here, these, this post got 322 comments. And that is a spectacular response, at least for us. I, I would call that, from what I've seen in the industry, a good response as well. It's definitely a good response compared to other posts on the Montana Facebook page. So there's that. There's a question. Now, here is an example of cross-promotion of travel planning and travel information site that we created for the state of Montana to sort of take them away from only relying on the central information model at visitnc.com. It's been very successful. But that stuff is out there, and we use the Montana Facebook page. Not only do we use the Montana Facebook page to make Get Lost more successful, but we use Get Lost to make the Montana Facebook page more successful. So here's an example of I've created this theme, this Thursday theme. So every Thursday I make a post um, centered around this things you didn't know existed Thursday idea. And on this day I'm talking about the old Montana prison complex and beer lodge. Um, fairly successful post, but um, at first, when we were posting things to get lost, or posting things from get lost, we didn't have this things you didn't know existed Thursday idea in our heads. And the posts were sometimes successful, sometimes not, depending on the particular allure of the place we were posting. But now, since we've created this sort of expectation that this is going to happen every Thursday, and this sort of theme, this assertion that you didn't know this existed, we've seen a much more consistent uptake of these posts. So that's just a couple of tips in terms of cross-promoting. But you know, you probably your brand, your destination has a lot of stuff that you don't realize you have. You might have um, specials that partners are running um, independent of yourself. You might have different parts of your website that don't get good organic traffic. 
but a really compelling content. So if you have a page on your website that you've spent a ton of time on really tweaking out and there's beautiful photos and videos or it's this wonderful narrative of somebody who's experienced your product, but you only get five or ten hits on that page every month, well, throw it on your, throw it on your social media channels. That's the perfect thing to expose people to and make both things more successful. So this is a, sort of my final example here, and this is, again, from the Montana page. And this I want to talk about for, I want to pause and talk about this for just a little bit because you see these two posts, they are short, they are not questions, they are not surveys, they do not have videos or photos or a link of any sort, they're not fresh news, they're not um, any of the sort of core, they don't have any sort of the core attributes that Facebook experts tend to say in their checklist that you should have to make a successful post. And so I just want to point this out. My experience in the years that I've been doing this and building these brands from the ground up is that, yes, videos and photos and then links and questions and surveys all do better on average than text-only posts. Videos and photos, videos especially if they can be embedded, if they're from YouTube or Vimeo, for instance, or a site that has connected with Facebook and allows embedding of their videos, those posts with those videos have a better chance, you can almost guarantee that they're going to be in the top tier of the posts that you do, if, if, at least if the video is compelling. Photos below that, then links to especially current news and journalism, questions, surveys, but, but, big but, um, every once in a while, if you really can get in the head of your brand, of your company, of your destination, and really get in the mindset of who am I and what would I say to my customers if they walked in the door right now and sat down on my couch to have a, a cup of tea. If you can find that, if you can capture that little moment in time of exactly what both parties would like to say to each other and like to talk about and put that into a small text-only post that is succinct and catchy and provocative to some extent, those posts are the ones that are going to be a breakout success. Um, we at the Montana page see an average feedback ratio. Well, let me let me pause um, for those out there who are not yet familiar with Facebook pages and these numbers. You'll see below the text of each post, we have two numbers. One is impressions and one is feedback, and it's a percentage. Impressions means how many times that post was shown to somebody on Facebook whether it was somebody who surfed directly to your brand's page or whether that story, that post was shown to them in their feed, their home feed on their home page, either because they already liked your brand's page or because one of their friends does and then interacted with this post. So those impressions numbers on these two posts are ridiculous for our page. Um, like I said, we have about 120,000 fans. Our average impressions on a good post are in the 70 to 80,000 range. These impressions for a text-only post out of this world. That feedback ratio on the bottom, on the bottom one there, this one right here, 1.58 percent. That is also off the charts. Just not only in terms of compared to other posts on the Montana page, but industry-wide for large pages, that's a huge feedback percentage. Um, and you can see the raw numbers there. I mean, to get 1,800 people to do anything at once um, is pretty tough. And I, I should say that this is not something that I'm able to accomplish regularly. Um, this is a specific example where I was surprised at how successful it was. But these sort of, you have to, my, my real point here is that if you can find your real voice, if you can figure out who you are as a brand, then you're going to come up with these things to say that don't necessarily match any of the top ten things to make your post successful on Facebook list out there. You're not going to necessarily fit any sort of weekly or monthly plan that you may have laid out, but they are going to be your most successful post, and they're going to expose your brand to far more people than all the other stuff that you do. So I really encourage you to figure out who you are and then talk like that person to your customers and revel in the, the results. This is my sort of three bullet point um, social media in a nutshell slide. Video is king. Photos are princes, but a truly catchy one-liner has the most potential of all. And I truly believe this, and I've found it to be true in all the Facebook pages that I have 
um, run both big and small. So definitely, I think, a good takeaway. This um, last slide that I want to show you is from our friends over at travel2.o.com. You can see their You can see their website address here at the bottom of the slide. And um, this is just, I think, kind of a useful who's who and what's what from all the relevant social media platforms. This is about six months old, but I think it's still relevant. Facebook Places and Guwala kind of had both lost to Foursquare. But overall, I think this is a good sort of overview and, and might help you decide what platform will be good for your business. I would recommend, if you're not anywhere yet, and if you're trying to decide where to put your um, efforts that you start with Facebook. Facebook is where 25% of Americans are spending their time, or where Americans are spending 25% of their time online. You're, it's almost guaranteed that some large portion of your real life audience is on Facebook. So that is that. It's time to tackle this thing. If you don't have a Facebook page, go out and start one, or choose a platform and start experimenting. But most importantly, think really hard. Get, get all the the people in your business who talk about how your business is going to be run in. and then talk about, write some things down, some of those suggestions I made earlier. What would your, what does your business love? What annoys your business? What would be its favorite color? What would it dress like? What would be its accent? These kinds of things. Um, and then make sure and come back October 6th because we're really going to take this to the next level. And I'm going to talk about some experience that I've had sort of combining ideas and leveraging multiple social media platforms, but more importantly, taking this idea of making a direct connection from the brand to the consumer to the next level. We're going to talk about really cementing that connection and and expanding, like giving them expanded long-form content that they're craving that they may not be able to get anywhere else, that you can answer their questions for them. So make sure to come back to I do and say thank you. Um, for coming, and we have a whole bunch of time to take questions, and I'm not afraid of hard questions. So definitely start asking your questions, or if you already have them, Jeremy will start putting them in my ear, and we'll talk about what we can do. Great. Thank you, Donnie. I want to thank you so much for that presentation. We've got tons of uh, great feedback and, uh, and a, lot of, um, a lot of interesting questions. So we have about... Uh, 12 minutes here to, to fire some questions your way, so let's get started. Um, we had a great question about um, about communicating uh, green improvement and sustainability practices um, via social media. The, the question is really, you know, do you have any thoughts on how, how one might do that and not just sound like every other company trying to portray themselves as green or portray their green status? How, you know, using the information on social media that you presented, how might how might one kind of approach that strategy? Well, I think this actually um, dovetails really well into some thinking that somebody else here at Mercury has been doing um, on this issue. And I think that especially your online audience, especially the people that I've been talking about who really know who you are and who can speak those sort of attempts to be somebody you're not, those same people are often, especially in the travel industry, and they're at a point where what has what they experienced for themselves or what their peers have experienced for themselves. So, in fact, they have a, a tendency to not trust what we say about ourselves, especially if we're saying something good about ourselves, right? So, um, as destinations and as brands. So, I think that what you want to try to do is encourage, instead of saying, hey, did you know that we've done X, Y, and Z this year to make our business more sustainable? What you might want to do is ask the question to your fan base, Hey, what's your like? If you had to pick one thing that we've done to make ourselves more sustainable that you think has made the most impact, what would it be? And sort of instead of um, pushing out a message, feed a conversation. That's how you're going to get buy-in. That's how you're going to get people who aren't thinking about this previous to that to really believe and trust the answer. Is if they not only hear it from you, but more importantly, hear it from their peers and people that have been there on the ground and seen it for themselves. Great, thanks. Um, I had a couple of people ask about uh, time and resources. Obviously, time and resources are often a challenge. Everyone, I'm wondering if you can tap in or um, you know any advice uh, for a particularly maybe a small business that's uh, really trying to to begin down this path. 
and nobody has unlimited time and resources. So um, I think that the first step is pick one platform. Probably that's going to be Facebook, but not every business is perfectly suited to Facebook. So that you might look around and think finances, or maybe you want to spend all your effort on Facebook. But what I'd say is pick one, especially if you're just getting started out, and just allow yourself like 15 minutes, three times of voicemail, and check in with your customers. And think about it like that. Instead of thinking of, I need to say something, it's good. You want to plan out things to say. You definitely want to have things to say. But I don't think that the frequency is as important of you pushing out messages as the frequency of you making sure that there's no questions going unanswered and conversations running wild without you there to help them be about what they should be about. So my advice to you, if you're worried about time and resources, which we all are, is um, to have paying attention. And even if at first you're not doing a great job of, of posting these wonderfully um, successful posts, if you pay attention, I mean, if, if there's one person one per, one customer, especially a really loyal customer that finds your Facebook page or your Twitter account and asks a question or tries to help promote you and then you can chime in and either answer them or support that effort and help them do that, that's gonna, that'll be worth your entire social media effort. Your entire social media strategy will have been vindicated if that one person uh, gets to experience your brand coming through for them like a real friend would, like they hope it would in their head. And the converse is true too. If you can find, if there's one person that uses social media who's had a bad experience with your brand, and you can use that channel to help them turn that experience around into something better, that's also worth the entire effort right there. So think in terms of that, and then as you as you figure out who you are, how your brand would talk, and who it would talk to, the rest will come naturally. And in fact, you'll start to think of it the same way you think of your personal work and spread news about yourself and kind of share your perspective. On the world, it won't become. It'll become less than work. It'll become something akin to fun and satisfaction. Donnie, we had a couple of people ask um, ask about posting uh, under their own name versus the company's name, and uh, definitely seen companies do both. Do you have any thoughts on when when one is appropriate and when the other is, or you know, does it matter? Well, um, it's pretty simple, really. If you're going to post as an ind individual on behalf of your brand, then you need to be ready for every other thing you ever post as an individual to be viewed as something that is not only, not only approved by, but coming from your brand as a message. So once you cross that line, I think it's fine and it's great because um, people like to talk to real people. So if you have somebody that's willing to be the company mascot, as it were, willing to be the voice and the face of the company as an actual person. I think that's great. That can, people respond really well to that. But you just have to be careful that you don't try to go halfway there and then get yourself in trouble because people are expecting that person to always be on, as it were. Um, so if you're on the fence about it, go ahead and create a company account, a company page. Um, you know, especially on Facebook, you can't really do the personal thing because personal accounts have a friend limit and pages have much more like analytics on them so you definitely want to go the page route but in terms of Twitter and other social media channels I think it's okay definitely to have individuals speaking for the cup for the company but those individuals need to be prepared to always be speaking for the company so that's my only piece of advice there. Great. We've had a we've had a number of questions about metrics, and I know you touched on metrics as well. But if you could um, you know, if you could just share how often do you think it's important to be you know reviewing your Facebook metrics and which ones do you look at and and um you know are, are you doing a lot of sort of A/B testing on on social media? Maybe you could just touch on those questions. Yeah, absolutely. So you know the. The hard answer to this is to, I think, to really get value out of um, analytics and metrics for social media, you have to do, you have to put in a lot of work. There's a lot of tools out there that will help you gather the data and sort of start to help you analyze, but to really put a dent in your strategy and to 
make a difference in what you're going to post in the future and feel confident that you're acting uh, uh, on science, you're going to have to do a lot of manual analysis. And I'll give the example of a Facebook page. So Facebook includes built-in good analytics. And it's automatically archived and they make pretty graphs for you and things. And those things are useful to show you, you know, how many people have done, have interacted with your page on a certain day or throughout the week or throughout the month and how many people have become fans and how many people are not fans anymore. And you can look at individual posts, like I showed you those two examples or those few examples. If it's your page, individual posts will have also um, stats for them on impressions and in terms of interactions like likes and comments and shares. Now it also shows you. But there's no easy way to aggregate that information effectively. And on top of that, Facebook stats are missing an important thing, and that is if you're posting a lot of links to external websites, which you probably will be, to journalism, to um, external versions of your website, to um, cool videos and things online, you're going to want to, Facebook is not going to tell you how many people click those links. They'll tell you how many people liked your post and how many people commented on your post, and they'll tell you how many impressions that post got, but they cannot, they are not going to tell you how many people clicked the link to exit Facebook and go look at whatever you're sending them to. And I think that's really important. Now, I've had lots of examples of posts that if I was just looking at Facebook, I would have considered mediocre. But because I was using a link, link shortening service, um, such as Bitly, B-I-T-L-Y, I know that those posts actually generated thousands of clicks to that content elsewhere on the internet. And if I had only paid attention to Facebook, I would have assumed that they were average performance posts that only a few hundred people saw and interacted with. So that's one way in which you have to combine information that's not readily combinable with automatic tools. And the other thing is what you really want to look at to impact your future strategy is how specific content performs relative to other content. And th there's no tool that can categorize the content that you're putting out there in terms of its tone, whether it's a question or not and um, whether it's a video or not, et cetera, et cetera, or how good you felt about it before you posted. And I think these things are really important. And so what I found is that to be effective, my tracking strategy has to include keeping track of every single thing I post and then including a lot of metadata about those posts. Is it a question? Is it text only? Is it picture? How did I, how, what did I, how did I think it was going to perform at the time? What day is it? What time of day is it? You know, how many other times have I posted that day? And, and in, I use an, a giant Excel spreadsheet, and that's the only way I've found that I can really dig deep into what I've been posting and find things that are performing well compared to other things. Because there's so many variables that you need to look at. Facebook does a great job of getting, giving you a top-line view of your page stats, but it does not do a good job of giving you, letting you dive into each individual post looking back into the past. And other platforms have even less integrated stats. So you do, you know, I use a free um, third-party tool for some of my accounts called ThinkUp, which is free but not hosted. So you have to have a server you can put it on. Um, the White House also uses it to track all its Twitter and Facebook posts. And I find that really useful. Go ahead and check it out. But, um, you know, you have to have these tools, but I, I have not found that you can avoid the big, huge spreadsheet and a lot of manual effort if you really want to track. Now, that being said, I know it's a really long-winded answer. I also think that you can be really successful in social media without spending a lot of time tracking. So if you don't have time, if all you have time to do is spend 15 minutes five times a day checking out your Facebook page and having conversations with your customers, and you don't have time to keep a huge spreadsheet of all of them or figure out what stats mean what, that's okay. The most important part is doing it, and as you go forward, if you find that you need to justify what you're doing or that you're really interested in taking it to the next level and making your content the best it can be every single time, the only way to do that is to take that leap into a lot of in-depth analysis, and that just takes a lot of work. Thanks, Donnie. I, I want to ask one more question, and, and maybe you can give it a 30-second answer so we don't run over, but I think it's an important one. <laughs> this might be tough to answer in 30 seconds, but there have been a number of questions about encouraging customers to write reviews on Facebook or TripAdvisor, and do you have like a 
you, you know, what's the one to two things that, that someone might do to encourage that um, behavior for their audience and have people participate in that community? You know, just like um, asking for likes on Facebook, which I didn't mention, but that's also a very effective strategy. You notice that both of those posts that got thousands of likes had me saying, like this post if, or every like this post will do X, Y, and Z. Those can be effective because people like to be asked specifically for what you want, and it's the same with TripAdvisor and other reviews. If you want people to write reviews about your business, ask them to write reviews about your business, and don't ask them. I mean, definitely have a card in their room and um, you know put it in front of them. But like during one of your actual interactions with them, whether it's online or more effectively in person at your front desk, ask them. Say, how was your stay? You know, we use TripAdvisor as our main sort of customer service avenue. So if you had a great stay, we'd really encourage you to go post there. And I guarantee you that 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 one-on-one -on -one interaction and asking in the course of a real interaction with somebody will be much more effective than trying to find ways to entice them and maybe go into gray areas about um, how TripAdvisor feels about that. Donnie, thank you so much. It was uh, it was really just a, a pleasure to, to hear you present. And I know from the feedback everyone, uh, everyone was giving that it was uh, really useful to our audience. And Donnie has already mentioned that we're going to be uh, you know, following up with part two next week. Um, I'll be sending out the link as part of this follow-up email in case anyone needs it. And we do, have, um, uh, we do have a number of questions that did not get answered, and uh, we're going to follow up via email with you um, if there's a question that we, uh, we didn't get to, so please look for that as well. I um, have a couple more things to go over with everyone, just so if you can hang on for two minutes. Um, Donnie, if we could move to the next slide. Just um, wanted to do a quick review of, um, of the programs that we offer at Sustainable Travel International. We, um, we as I mentioned at the, at the outset, we work with businesses and destinations on a, on a variety of uh, solutions that impact um, sustainability on the triple bottom line. Uh, this is just a, a short list, and there's tons of information obviously available on our website and our social media network. So please come, uh, please come visit us there to learn more. Uh, next slide. Um, in terms of logistics, uh, as I mentioned, we're the, um, sending out the, uh, the recording after this presentation via email. Um, as part of that email, I want everyone to, to try and pay attention to our survey link that we have. We uh, believe very strongly in asking for feedback and the space for us to, um, to survey our audience and ask uh, your impressions of this webinar. That feedback is very helpful for us to, to continue to build our educational offerings. So please, if you wouldn't mind taking that five minutes just to answer that survey. And as a bonus, um, all of those who participate in the survey are going to be able to be selected for a 30-minute social media strategy session. Mercury. So if you like the information you heard here, we're going to be um, we're going to be picking one out of uh, out of everyone who responds. So please do take that survey. <laughs> and you get to uh, you get to see Donnie's smiling face a little bit more. <laughs> um, finally, final slide. There's some contact information for STI. Um, please feel free to follow up with us with any questions or um, visit us on the web or certainly uh, our Facebook or Twitter feed. And that is all for today. We'll see you all next week. And thanks again to Donnie and Mercury CSC. Have a great day, everyone.